Roadway International proudly presents its comprehensive maintenance video series. This video series continues the Roadway International tradition of providing their customers with the best product support in the industry. The design and production of the maintenance video series has one main purpose to have you take off and experience the unique thrill of flying your very own Exec 162F helicopter with a safer and more secure feeling. Following Rotaway International's scheduled maintenance will mean safety, normal component times, and peace of mind. This video series will feature and demonstrate maintenance procedures of the Exec 162F helicopter kit. Throughout the video, there will be times that demonstrate some maintenance procedures with certain components removed. Now this is done for clarity. You will note that at times the oil bath and the fan shroud have been removed. This is done to provide a better visual presentation of the procedures. Okay, let's take a look at the tail. The 25 thousandths aluminum skin has not been installed on this tail boom to allow a better view of the tail rotor drive system. Now, while it's not necessary to remove the engine for any maintenance, except for the scheduled overhaul at 1,000 hours, you will note at times the engine will be displayed on a stand for a better view of some of the procedures. Now, let me briefly discuss the legal requirements necessary to perform maintenance on the Exec 162F helicopter. Before performing any maintenance or repair on any U.S. registered experimental aircraft, the owner builder must apply for a repairman certificate from the FAA. The application, 8610-2, shown here, is available from your local FAA office. The repairman certificate is only available to those who have built 51% or more of the specific aircraft they have had inspected for airworthiness. In other words, you'll only be certified to work on your helicopter. It's up to the owner builder to maintain accurate maintenance logs for the helicopter. Normally, two log books are kept for maintenance records. One log book is dedicated to the engine and one for the aircraft and its components. It is also a good practice to keep a three-ring binder to record more detailed information such as valve lash measurements, differential cylinder pressures, and other items. This will help you track any indications of abnormal wear. During the first 10 hours of operation, there are several important maintenance procedures that must be performed. The maintenance video series begins with the first minutes of operation and will take you step by step through the first 10 hours. Then the video will follow the regular service intervals of 25, 50, 100, 250, 500, and 1,000 hours. Note, it's very important for you to understand that the service hour intervals in this video are recommended as a guide. Each builder owner should monitor, inspect, and or replace parts if necessary prior to the recommended change out time of the component if they become suspect. Be aware that incorrect installation, cleaning procedures, environment, and or premature part failure will contribute to shorter component life. Now, let's review Rotaway International's maintenance manuals and some guidelines on how to use them. Your Exec 162F helicopter kit comes with an operations and maintenance manual for the RI-162 engine and one maintenance manual. The maintenance schedules have been designed to provide the owner-operator the lowest operating cost possible while maintaining the flight characteristics and safety of their helicopter. Always use the manuals that come with your kit as the main source of information and the latest updates. In the maintenance manual of each section shows a chart with the inspection interval, recommended change-out time or RCO, and a service reference for each part. The service reference directs the builder to the procedure to be followed for each inspection or service. In most cases, the service note is found on the following page. It can be a footnote or the construction manual section may be referenced. Most of the parts listed are given a specific lifetime and must be replaced at the RCO specified in the inspection chart. Even though upon visual inspection these items might not appear to be worn out, they may have a fatigue life that requires their replacement before visual evidence appears. This policy provides each part with a safety factor to enable its replacement before failure. The RCO time represents the lifetime of the component as recommended by the manufacturer. A phrase called on condition or OC is also utilized.
This means the part should be monitored and replaced if suspect prior to the recommended change out time of the component. Common examples of parts that qualify for on condition replacement are bearings and belts. Now, when these parts are not correctly installed or not cleaned properly, they may fail prematurely. Even though close quality control procedures are adhered to, a part may fail prematurely due to a variety of reasons. Incorrect manufacturing procedures, builder errors, environmental conditions, and storage conditions may all contribute. Because premature failures can happen, it's important to monitor all major components during pre- and post-flight inspections. Clearance for tolerances for proper inspection will be noted in the manual and video, if applicable, for part replacement. The tools required to perform the maintenance on the exec helicopters are the same as required for its construction. Now, there will be a few special tools required that will be shown throughout the video, along with purchase information. For example, a good quality torque wrench is a precision instrument designed to accurately measure torque and is a must to properly maintain your helicopter. You know, every effort has been made to make the maintenance video series as up-to-date as possible. However, as Rotaway International makes changes and improvements, sometimes there is a delay before the videos can be updated. For these reasons, if there are some parts that look slightly different or you find other component differences, always consult the manuals that came with your helicopter as a final authority for construction and maintenance procedures. Be sure to follow closely the preparation and first startup procedures in section 26 of the construction video series. There are several things you should monitor closely during the first operations. Constantly inspect for leaks of fuel, oil, or coolant. Monitor the water temperature and oil pressure at all times. Rebleed the coolant system after each of the first few starts to ensure the complete removal of air. Always inspect all hoses for proper positioning and that they are away from any heat sources. Check and verify the oil level in the sump. After the engine has stopped, allow time for the oil to completely drain back into the sump. Add oil to bring the level between the marks on the dipstick. After the first start, Check and adjust the tension every 15 minutes that the engine is running, idle or operating RPM, until no further adjustment is required. The belts must be kept clean and free of any oil, dirt, or other contamination. Use a clean cloth, damp but not dripping with acetone, to clean the belts. The three new tail rotor drive belts will stretch rapidly during this time and it is very important to prevent them from becoming too loose. A belt that is too loose could be damaged internally by rolling over the edges of the pulleys. It can also be damaged by the heat created from excessive slipping. 
Any belt that has rolled over may be damaged internally and must be replaced immediately to prevent belt failure. As part of your pre- and post-flight inspections, you must always examine the temperature strips. Pay close attention to these strips during the first hours of operation. After this break-in period, if the 170-degree dot darkens, it is an indication that a belt may be slipping or some other problem exists. The problem must be identified and corrected before continuing operations or flight. If the 180 degree or higher dot darkens, the belts have been damaged internally from heat and must be replaced. Be aware that there may be other factors that cause the 180 degree temp strip to darken. Be sure to make a complete inspection of the entire drive system. To tension the belts, first loosen the rear one quarter inch bolts and the tail rotor shaft bearing flanges. Then back off the 5 16 inch jam nuts. Turn the 5 16 inch nuts on the all thread rods clockwise to tighten the belts. Keep the tail rotor shaft perpendicular to the aircraft center line by turning the nuts equally. Rotate the tail rotor shaft while tapping on the self-aligning bearing flanges. Verify the belt tension at the first bulkhead. The proper tension should deflect the belt one and three eighths of an inch with 10 pounds of pressure from the tensioning tool. When the belts are at the correct tension, retighten the one quarter inch bearing flange bolts and tighten the jam nuts on the all threaded rod. Verify the belt tension at the first bulkhead. Monitor the tension on the main drive belts. New belts, depending on power demands on the engine, could require up to seven hours to fully stretch. As required by most experimental aircraft limitations, newly constructed aircraft must fly without passengers for a certain amount of time. For this reason, newly installed belts may seem to stop stretching. Then when a passenger is carried, the belts may stretch even further. Be aware of this situation. The main belts must be tensioned to a one half inch deflection with a seven and one half pound pull with the idler pulley tube weldment disconnected from the clutch handle casting. Do not over tighten the main drive belts. These belts will stretch during the break-in period, and it will be important to maintain the proper tension to prevent the belt slipping and wearing the anodized finish on the engine pulley. In most cases, the engine will need to be moved at least one-half to five-eighths of an inch overall from its original installation position to compensate the stretching of the main belts during this break-in period. After tensioning the main drive belts, the engine must be leveled laterally 
and fore and aft in relation to the square drive tubes. Verify the proper adjustment of the clutch spring tube weldment. When the clutch is disengaged, the idler pulley should just touch the main drive belts and not deflect the belts outward. The piston should be against the rivets. Do not be tempted to adjust the spring tube pressure to tighten the belts, as this will only reduce the amount of surface area that the belts contact on the engine pulley and will cause the belts to slip even more. There should be a minimum of one half inch clearance between the lower side of the spring tube and the aluminum actuator arm with the clutch engaged and the engine not running. Removal of a portion of the spring tube on the lower half is normally required to achieve this clearance. Never use a belt dressing to eliminate belt slippage. Damage will occur when the dressing is contaminated with dirt and the belts become abrasive to the anodized surface of the pulley. Keep the main drive belts free of any contamination. Use a cloth, damp but not dripping, with acetone to clean the belts. Do not clean the belts with any other cleaners. Use only acetone. Do not use mechanical methods to clean the belts. The use of sandpaper or wire brushes will damage the belts. Check the belt tension of the accessory components. The water pump alternator belt's correct tension can be determined by rotating the alternator fan. You should be able to turn it just by hand if it has the proper tension. The fan drive belts should be tight enough to prevent slipping. It is extremely important to make these inspections and adjustments every time you are required by the maintenance schedule to inspect the valve train. These inspections will require rotating the engine. The best way to rotate the engine is with a specially made tool which grips the flywheel ring gear. The source for this tool is snap-on tools. The snap-on part number is A144A. You can order a snap-on tools catalog by calling 800-866-5748 or visit their website at snapon.com. The secondary can also be used to rotate the engine as shown here. Because the rocker box area is oily, use caution to prevent the oil in your hands from contaminating the belts and secondary pulley. Turning the secondary by hand for gross movement and using the flywheel tool for more precise movement is a good combination. Do not attempt to rotate the engine by engaging the starter or by rotating the main rotor blades counterclockwise by hand. This can cause damage to the rotor system and displace the lead lag adjustments. Also, be aware with the main rotor blades attached, any movement of the engine in a clockwise direction will cause the blades to rotate. As a precaution, always disconnect the positive cables from the battery before servicing the engine valve train and drive components. Access the flywheel from the pilot side. Disconnect the tank heat shield and use the flywheel tool to rotate the engine counterclockwise as shown. You may also remove one spark plug from each cylinder to allow the engine to turn easier. Remove the two bolts securing each valve rocker covers and remove the covers. Prepare for a small amount of oil to drain from the rocker box.
Now before we proceed any further, let's get an orientation of the RI-162F engine. From the front of the engine or intake side, the cylinders are numbered as follows. The top right is number one, bottom right is number two, top left number three, and bottom left number four. The cylinder numbers are stamped on the cylinder heads near the spark plug holes as shown. Always note that each cylinder's intake valve is inboard and the exhaust valve is outboard. To locate top dead center or full firing position for cylinder number one, rotate the engine counterclockwise until you line up the zero degree index on the flywheel with the index located on the starter mount. Now make sure both the intake and exhaust valves for cylinder number one are fully closed. You should find the rockers on cylinder number one will be able to move as shown. If they are tight against the valve stems, the engine is at top dead center for cylinder number three and you must rotate the engine one full turn to get to top dead center for cylinder number one. Locating top dead center of each piston will be necessary when we demonstrate the leak down test at the 100 hour service interval. To make the following inspections and valve lash adjustment, we need to rotate the flywheel to a different position. We will start from top dead center of cylinder number one. Note, it is not necessary to start at top dead center of cylinder number one when doing lash inspection. However, it is used as a reference in this video to get a better understanding of the order of valve train movement. From top dead center of cylinder number one, rotate the engine flywheel counterclockwise from the top until the large slot openings in the flywheel are in line or parallel with the engine's center line as shown. When the engine is installed in the helicopter, this position can be verified by looking through the inspection panel behind the pilot seat upholstery. In this flywheel position, you'll notice that the exhaust or outboard valve of number three and the intake or inboard valve of number two are open. The valve stems are depressed. The valves opposite these open valves are ready for inspection, measurement, and or adjustment. In other words, exhaust valve on cylinder one is fully closed, and the intake valve on cylinder number four is fully closed. Each 180 degree turn of the flywheel will open another two valves. So the next 180 degree rotation will open intake valve of cylinder one and exhaust valve of cylinder two. The next 180 degree rotation will open intake of cylinder four and exhaust of cylinder one. The next 180 degree rotation will open intake of cylinder three and exhaust of cylinder four. Reference this table for valve positioning and inspection. Remember the valves opposite the open valves are positioned for lash inspection, measurement or adjustment. The following three inspections should be done before each valve lash measurement. While these parts normally do not wear and require no maintenance, it is important to monitor their condition in order to prevent failure. Note the identification of the following parts. This is the lash cap, a set of keepers, and the spring retainer. The first inspection is the spring retainer. Note the relative depth of the keeper set in each spring retainer. You may notice a slight variance on different valves, but no keeper set should be sunk deeply into a retainer. This rocker arm is removed for a better view. 
The important thing to look for is any change in the relative position of each keeper set. If you determine that a keeper set seems to be sinking deeper into its retainer, do not continue to operate the engine. Call customer service for further instructions. If the keeper sinks into the retainer, the rocker will eventually hit and leave a mark on the retainer. The second item is the valve stem and the keepers. If you look closely at the top of each valve assembly, you will notice a gap between the lash cap and the keepers. If excessive wear occurs between valve and the keepers, this gap will decrease and eventually the lash cap will contact the keepers. Continued wear beyond this point can cause engine failure. This gap is normally between 20 thousandths and 30 thousandths of an inch. While it is not necessary to measure this gap exactly, it is important to note any radical change. Reference the drawing in the RI-162F engine manual to make a wire gauge which will be used to monitor this gap on each valve. Fabricate this gauge from a piece of 30,000 safety wire. Use a hammer to flatten one end of the wire to a thickness of 10 thousandths to 15 thousandths of an inch. The 10 to 15 thousandths end should easily fit into the gap. The 30 thousandths end should fit snugly if it will go into the gap at all. Do not continue to operate the engine if the keeper contacts the lash cap. Call customer service for further instructions if anywhere of these components is apparent. And the third inspection before valve lash inspection and adjustment is the valve guide. If excessive wear occurs between a valve and valve guide, the guide will develop an hourglass shape on its inside diameter. This can cause excessive oil consumption, and if wear becomes extreme, it will cause engine failure by damaging the valve itself. To inspect for wear, rotate the engine counterclockwise from the top looking down to the proper position for valve lash adjustment of the individual valve valve guide to be inspected. Prior to measuring and adjusting the valve lash, grasp the valve spring retainer with your fingers and move it up and down. During this process, look between the coils of the valve spring and watch the part of the valve stem which protrudes from the guide. Wear would be evident by excessive movement and by a visible gap between the valve stem and guide. You will need to use a fair amount of pressure to get any movement, but under all conditions, never use a tool to pry on the assembly. It is helpful to use a small inspection light to get a better view. Also look for small amounts of oil being forced out of the valve guides as shown here. This is a normal valve stem and guide. Note, this is a subjective measurement, since the valve spring is trying to keep the valve from moving, and varying degrees of pressure will cause different amounts of deflection. However, you should be able to notice a difference between a normal assembly and one which has valve guide wear, as shown here. If you determine that a valve may have more play than normal, call Rotorway Customer Service for more information. Valve lash adjustments can only be made after the engine has cooled down and its internal temperature has stabilized at 50 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The aluminum case, water jackets, and cylinder heads will expand with temperature more than the steel push rods, causing a major difference between hot and cold valve lash. Adjustments made to a warm engine can result in valves not closing when the engine is cool, and conversely, if the engine is too cold, when making the adjustments, the lash settings will be too big at operating temperature. Rotate the engine in a counterclockwise direction, looking down from the top, until two valves are fully open as shown earlier. These slot openings should be in line with the engine's center line. Two valves will open every 180 crankshaft degrees of rotation. The rocker arm opposite from the valve, which is open, is now ready for measurement and adjustment. Use a narrow thickness gauge. L.S. Starrett Company has available a thickness gauge set that has tapered leaves that work perfectly for the lash measurements. The tool part number is 172CT. Contact the L.S. Starrett Company at 978-249 3551 or stareit.com for a distributor in your area. W.W. W. Granger is a LS Stareit distributor and has this thickness gauge in their catalog. 
Measure the clearance as follows. Insert the blade between the rocker and the lash cap. Note, the measurement is the distance between the lash cap and this convex surface of the rocker. This is why you must move the rocker up and down slightly to center the rocker on the lash cap to get an accurate measurement. Be sure you have found the sweet spot between the lash cap and rocker to make the proper measurement. The proper measurement is determined when the thickness gauge has a light drag when moved back and forth. The specification for the RI-162 engine valve lash clearance is four thousandths to six thousandths of an inch. It is important to measure and record the lash before any adjustment is made. In addition to making the correct adjustment, you are also monitoring the valve train for excessive wear of parts. A clear and simple indication of wear in the valve train is continued development of excessive lash on any one valve. This is why Rotaway recommends you keep records of all valve lash measurements and adjustments. Anytime a lash measurement is made and several valves have a lash of more than eight thousandths of an inch, this is a clear indication that you need to make more regular adjustments. Any lash found in excess of eight thousandths of an inch warrants further inspection of the corresponding lash cap. Because of the design of the camshaft and the RI-162F engine, it is essential that proper lash be maintained. Excessive lash will cause damage to the lash caps, push rods, camshaft, and timing gear. If an adjustment is required, follow this procedure. The tools required to perform these adjustments are as shown. A thickness gauge, a 5 8 inch combination wrench, a 3 16 inch hex drive, and an inch pound torque wrench. Loosen the poly lock nut. The method of loosening the poly lock nut is to back off the set screw. If you back off the nut without loosening the set screw, you could possibly back out the rocker stud. With the 4 thousandths feeler gauge in place, tighten the rocker nut by hand until the 4 thousandths leaf is snug when you move the gauge back and forth. Remember to find the sweet spot. Hold the nut in place and tighten the set screw to 120 inch pounds. Check the adjustment. The 4 thousandths inch leaf should easily slide between the rocker and the lash cap. Now select the 6 thousandths leaf on the thickness gauge. If it can be inserted, it must have a light drag when moved back and forth between the rocker and the lash cap. Never over tighten the nut after the set screw has been tightened to reduce lash. The reason that you are instructed to first turn the rocker nut down snug by hand is that the tightening of the set screw causes the nut to back off slightly and loosen up the adjustment. If you find you can insert the 4 thousandths leaf but cannot insert the 6 thousandths leaf, you have obtained the correct lash adjustment. A little practice will give you the right feel for the process. After measuring and or adjusting a valve lash, make a mark on a rocker box to verify you have checked that valve. Rotate the engine another 180 degrees. This will open another two valves. Loosen the poly lock nut.
Put the four thousandths feeler gauge in place. Tighten the rocker nut by hand until the four thousandths leaf is snug when you move the gauge back and forth. Hold the nut in place and tighten the set screw to 120 inch pounds. Check the adjustment. The four thousandths inch leaf should easily slide between the rocker and the lash cap. If you find you can insert the four thousandths leaf but cannot insert the six thousandths leaf, you have obtained the correct lash adjustment. Continue the process until all of the valves are measured and adjusted. Then rotate the engine two full rotations and recheck all eight valve lash settings. Before installing the valve covers, always inspect the rubber O-rings on all four bolts and replace them if necessary. Inspect the valve cover gaskets and replace them if necessary. If you need to replace the gasket, use silicone gasket adhesive to secure the gasket to the valve cover. Use Dow Corning RTV 735 silicone sealant. Do not use silicone between the gasket and the cylinder head rocker box. Center the cover both vertically and horizontally over the cylinder head rocker box. When using the same gasket, you should be able to feel the cover seat itself as it slips into the previously formed depression. Insert the bolts and tighten them finger tight only. Visually check to ensure that only the gasket is contacting the cylinder head. Alternately tighten the bolts to evenly seat the gaskets and repeat the process for the other cover. Caution, do not over tighten the valve cover bolts as this will cause the gasket to extrude and tear. Check for oil leaks after engine startup. Retorque the bolts and exhaust manifold flanges, intake manifolds, and water jacket fittings. The water jacket fitting bolt should be retorqued to 10 foot pounds. Use an extra long 3 16 of an inch ball hex end bit to retorque the bolts. The intake manifold bolt should be retorqued to 12 foot pounds. 
Use an extra long quarter inch ball hex end bit to retorque the bolts. The exhaust manifold flange bolt should be retorqued to 10 foot pounds. This is important and must be checked. You will want to monitor and retorque the exhaust manifold bolts for the first several hours. Because of heat and vibrations, these bolts could work loose if they are not retorqued. Inspect the cooling system. Check the entire system, including the engine, for any signs of coolant leaks. Make sure all hose clamps are installed past the bead or flare on the end of the adjoining tube or fitting and retighten them. Check the hoses, making sure there is no interference with vibrating or rotating parts. Make sure there is no sign of heat damage. Inspect the top and bottom side of the radiator. Debris such as grass clippings and leaves can collect on the top side of the radiator, especially during first hovering operations with the rear fuselage panels removed. Note, this radiator was removed after approximately 50 hours to better view the collection of debris, belt dust, and dirt collected on the top side. It will need to be cleaned. If inspection of the radiator reveals a need for cleaning, spray it with a mild soapy water solution using soft to medium pressure. Do not use a hard stream of water. Damage to the radiator fins will occur. Check the entire system for any sign of leakage. Check each and every oil connection by running your finger around the connector and look for traces of oil. Also check the lines for proper clearance from other parts and heat sources. Check the security of all oil line connections. Oil pressure adjustments must be made when the engine is at operating temperature. The only time oil pressure would need to be adjusted when the engine is cold would be if the oil pressure did not meet the minimum or maximum specifications on initial startup. Oil pressure must fall within the stated parameters at idle and full RPM. The oil pressure requirements are 40 PSI minimum at idle and at 4,250 RPM, 45 PSI minimum and 70 PSI maximum. Note, the oil pressure was set at the factory during testing of the engine. A slight adjustment may have to be made 
in order to tune the pressure regulator to your ship's particular oil system. This adjustment should be minor and should not have to be made during initial warm-up of your engine. However, do not take this for granted. Carefully monitor your oil pressure at all times. To adjust the oil pressure, first review the exploded view of the oil pump cover and the pressure regulator components found in the lower cover assembly drawing in section 5 of the engine manual. Take the time to become familiar with the component parts. It is recommended, but not necessary, that when you make any adjustment to the oil pressure, do it only when the engine is stopped. As you will notice, the adjustment requires that your hands come in close proximity to the hot exhaust system. This, in conjunction with generally close quarters, warrants special care from a safety point of view. Engine oil pressure adjustment temperature range is 180 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. To make the adjustment, Loosen the jam nut on the socket head and cap screw. Be careful not to move the cap screw when loosening the nut. Turning the cap screw clockwise will increase the oil pressure, and turning counterclockwise will lower the pressure. It is suggested that you turn the cap screw in increments of one quarter turn at a time until a desired pressure is achieved. Each time an adjustment is made, retorque the jam nut to 108 inch pounds. If continued adjustment is required, or if no pressure effect is noticed with screw rotation, then contact customer service. If after time an oil leak is found around the socket head cap screw where it enters the regulator plug, the O-ring must be replaced. Make an index mark on the bolt. To replace the O-ring, remove the cap screw while carefully counting the exact number of turns as it comes out. Be prepared for a small stream of oil to drain out of the regulator plug. Replace the O-ring. When you reinstall the cap screw, turn it in exactly the same number of turns. During any adjustment, pay close attention to the oil pressure. 
make sure you are not running the engine with the incorrect oil pressure. Caution, the battery must be disconnected before any work or service is performed on the fuel system. Check the security of all fuel hoses and check for any signs of fuel leaks on each and every connection of the entire system. Check all the wiring for proper mounting, connection, and condition. Check the spark plug wires for proper mounting and condition. Replace any wire that shows any sign of damage. Inspect the FADEC wiring. Check all the FADEC wiring for proper mounting, connection, and condition. While idling the engine, carefully wiggle all FADEC system connector plugs and wires. Pay special attention to the main ECU plugs and wiring bundles. Inspect the throttle control. Check the return spring and linkage for proper adjustment and freedom of movement. Note with collective in the hover position, Turn on FADEC 1 and set the digital monitor display to throttle position. To verify the correct throttle cable adjustment, you should be able to roll 100% throttle with the collective in this position. Inspect the exhaust system for leaks. Check the entire exhaust system for cracks or leaks. A proper fit of each exhaust manifold flange to its mating port is important. This can be verified while idling the engine and positioning your finger approximately one half inches away from the exhaust port. Test all the way around the circumference of each port for escaping gases. If no turbulence is felt within the proximity, you can be assured that the system will be sufficiently leak-free at full RPM. If you should discover a leak in one of the ports, it is imperative that you replace that gasket. Any type of exhaust system leak may allow carbon monoxide fumes to enter the cabin area. 
Exposure to these films can be fatal. Therefore, any indication of leakage must be corrected before operation is continued. Check the area of the heat shielding where the exhaust manifolds pass through for proper clearance. Verify the edges of heat shield are not touching the manifold. Note this exhaust manifold shows some chafing where the heat shield has contacted the manifold. It can be repaired by rewrapping the area and securing the wraps with high temp straps. You should also increase the opening in the heat shield. The following procedures are to be done after the first five hours of operations. Torque the cylinder head bolts. The engine must be cold when torquing these bolts. Refer to this diagram in the engine manual for cylinder head bolt sequence and location. When retorquing the cylinder head bolts on the passenger side, rotate the engine to position these two rockers for lash adjustment. Remove the rockers to access the bolts shown here. Remember to measure and record the lash before removing the rockers for access to the cylinder head bolts. Use a block of wood marked with cylinder numbers and valves to keep the rocker arms assigned to their proper valve until reinstallation. The retorque procedure is as follows. With one bolt at a time, loosen each bolt 90 degrees. Then retorque the bolt to 22 foot pounds. As you tighten the bolt, it is important to note the amount of rotation necessary when the bolt torques at 22 foot pounds. Make note of any bolt that requires more than 90 degrees to torque. The intake manifold has been removed to show access to these cylinder head bolts. Never use a torque wrench to break free the bolts. Damage to the calibration of the wrench could occur. Use a breaker arm or a ratchet to loosen the bolts.
Make sure the tip of the pushrod seats properly in the rocker arm when installing. Perform the lash adjustments as shown earlier. To obtain accurate lash adjustments, you must always torque all of the cylinder head bolts first before performing final lash adjustments. Note, when retorquing the cylinder head bolts on the pilot side, you'll need to rotate the engine to two separate positions to remove the rockers to access these bolts. Refer to the lash measurement and adjustment procedures shown earlier. After retorquing the cylinder head bolts, perform a complete lash measurement and adjustment. At five hours of operation, it is necessary to inspect and clean the cartridge filter of the fuel shutoff filter assembly. With the shutoff in the off position, the filter can be serviced without draining the tanks. Remember the battery must be disconnected when performing any service to the fuel system. Have a fire extinguisher nearby. Position an appropriate container under the helicopter and fabricate a tray to direct any spilled fuel into the container. Hold this fitting with a wrench and disconnect the fuel hose. Be prepared for fuel to drain out of the assembly. Hold this fitting with a wrench and remove the fitting. The fitting should loosen with a minimum amount of force, but be careful not to damage the assembly. Remove the fitting, screen filter, and spring. Carefully clean the filter and the inside diameter of the housing. If there is a large amount of debris trapped in the filter, this would be an indication that more frequent inspection is required. Replace the smaller O-ring. Do not reuse this O-ring. It is suitable to reuse the larger O-ring if it shows no sign of wear or damage. Place a film of petroleum jelly in the O-rings and on the threads of the fitting and in a tapered section of the housing bore.
Carefully reinstall all the components. Do not over tighten this fitting. The seal is made by the O-rings and not by how tight the fitting is secured. Over tightening can result in damage to the assembly. Reconnect the hose to the fitting and carefully leak check the system prior to starting the engine. Repeat all first hour items as shown earlier. The following procedures should be performed after the first 10 hours of operation. Change the oil and filter. Remove the drain plug in the coolant oil heat exchanger. Configure a drain hose with an end large enough to fit snug over the oil drain fitting when the plug is removed. Prepare for some oil to spill as you remove the plug. Collect the used oil in a container and dispose of it responsibly. Remove the oil filter. As instructed in the engine manual and construction video, fill the new oil filter with oil so when the engine starts the oil pressure will come up in about three to seven seconds. Add a total of 4.5 quarts of oil. Verify the oil level with the dipstick. Only add 5 quarts of oil for a new aircraft. 
Repeat all first hour items as shown earlier. The following maintenance items are to be performed every 25 hours on your helicopter. Retorque the cylinder head bolts. Measure and adjust the valve lash and inspect valve train. Perform in conjunction with cylinder head torque service as shown earlier. Refer to the specifications for correct type of grease for your flying environment. It is advisable to dedicate a grease gun specifically for helicopter service. The main drive pulley requires three shots of grease every 25 hours. Grease must be pumped in very slowly. Rapid introduction of grease may cause the bearing seals to blow out. Inspect cooling system. Check entire system, including engine, for any sign of leakage. Retighten all hose clamps. Check the hoses, making sure that there is no interference with vibrating or rotating parts or any sign of heat damage. Inspect oil system. Check entire system for any sign of leakage. Check the security of all oil line connections. Also check the lines for proper clearance from heat sources and other parts. Change the oil and oil filter. Note, change the oil and filter every six months even if 25 hours of operation has not yet occurred. Inspect fuel system. Check the security of all fuel hoses and check for any signs of leakage on the entire system. At 25 hours of operation, it is necessary to inspect and clean the cartridge filter of the fuel shutoff filter assembly. If there is a large amount of debris trapped in the filter, this would be an indication that more frequent inspection is required. Inspect exhaust system. Check entire exhaust system for cracks and leaks. Retorque the exhaust manifold flange bolts. Inspect ignition system. Check all wiring, including spark plug wires, for proper mounting and condition. Inspect throttle control. Check return spring and linkage for proper adjustment and freedom of movement. Check cable ends and cable for wear. Retorque the bolts on the intake manifolds and water jacket fitting elbows. Service air filter. Clean as necessary and inspect for damage. The air filter must remain clean in order to maintain proper engine performance. A common cause of power loss is a clogged or dirty air filter. A restrictive air filter will cause the engine to operate in an overly rich condition, which could cause engine damage. If the air filter appears dirty, or if it has been contaminated with grease, cleaning and re-oiling is required. If damage is evident, or if it cannot be properly cleaned, replace the air filter. Certain local conditions may warrant an inspection and cleaning on a more regular basis than the 25-hour interval. 
caution, only use K&N brand of air filter oil and cleaning products. Lightly brush and tap off any surface dirt. Caution, heavy brushing will damage the gauze. Spray K and N cleaner liberally onto the entire element. Let soak for ten minutes. Rinse the element with low water pressure. Tap water is okay. Always flush from the clean side to the dirty side. This removes the dirt and does not drive it into the filter. After rinsing, shake off all excess water and let the element dry naturally. Never attempt to accelerate the drying process by using compressed air to blow through the filter. This will damage the air filter. After the filter is air dried, the filter must be oiled. Gently squeeze a small stream of K&N filter oil along the entire length of each plate. Caution, use restraint as the oil tends to flow profusely and it is easy to get too much on the filter. Do not over oil. Any white patches remaining after 20 minutes may be finished off with a drop or two of oil. The secondary unit comes as a complete assembly and should not be tampered with or opened at any time. Any other adjustment and work performed must be done at the factory service center at Rotorway. Note the upper bearing assembly of the secondary requires one shot of Mystic JT6 grease every 25 hours. Inspect the tail rotor assembly. Check the end play of the pitch pins. It may be necessary to add grease through these fittings on the tail rotor barrel. Usually one shot of grease is all that is necessary. Look for the grease to come out near the pitch horns and wipe off the excess. Drill a 3 16 inch hole in each blade tip so the grease thrown out by centrifugal force will not build up inside the blade. Inspect the security of all the bolts and linkage of the tail rotor assembly.
Check the security of the cotter pins. The tail rotor shaft should be free of dirt and sand. Make sure the shaft has a coating of grease. At the 25 hour service interval, the tail rotor belt spring tool should be calibrated to verify its accuracy. Inspect the blade straps. Look for any deformities and cracks in the straps. Check for any sign of the strap bolts bending. Check for any gaps between straps and the washers. Check at the lower blade straps where the teeter stops make contact with the shaft. Check for blade skin delamination using the tap test hammer. Tap along the rivet line as shown here. You should notice a solid sound resonating from the blade. Tap repeatedly along the seam listening for noticeable sound changes. If the sound changes from a solid to hollow sound, as demonstrated here by tapping away from the spar, the blade skin may have delaminated from the spar at that location and Rotaway customer service should be notified. Tap along the full length of the blade on both the upper and lower skins. The tap test should be performed every 25 hours, every three months, or after flying in violent weather conditions. After you have had your helicopter at operating RPM and hovering for several hours, newly painted blades can develop paint blisters or have paint erosion due to the type of conditions the helicopter is flown in. This can cause out of tracking conditions or vibration in the rotor system. Keeping the leading edge smooth can be maintained by wet sanding the edge of the blade with 400 grit wet dry sandpaper and feathering the paint to a smooth edge. Tracking and vibration should return to a normal condition. Note, Rotorway does not recommend the use of leading edge tape. Check the tip weight bolts for tightness every 25 hours. It is not necessary to remove the end plug from the blade unless the bolts become loose. A low rotor RPM on the helicopter can cause wrinkling of the blade skins to the outboard side of the fiberglass doublers. If these conditions have occurred, contact Rotorway for further instructions. Blade fatigue is very difficult for a new and low time pilot to sense. Some of the symptoms of blade fatigue are as follows. Change in blade droop while in a static position from the previous inspection.
The input from the flight controls seems sluggish and insensitive. During auto rotation flare, the blade will develop a shake that will not stop until collective pitch can be reduced. Blade tracking seems to keep moving in and out and cannot be stabilized. Caution, blade fatigue is a dangerous condition and can result in a serious incident if left undetected. The teeter block has a grease fitting that should have a couple of shots of grease every 25 hours. The grease should come through the bearing and be visible on the outer race of the bearing. Wipe off the excess grease to prevent it from being thrown onto the blades during operation. Check the security of the bolts of the rotor system. Check the end play in the male rod ends of the pitch link control rods. Check the integrity of the safety clip on the ballast weight pin. This concludes the 25 hour service and inspection. Remember, these procedures must be done every 25 hours, and you must also enter the service and inspections performed in your helicopter's engine and airframe logbooks. The entry in your logbook should be as follows. Record the actual Hobbs meter time and date. 25-hour scheduled service performed as recommended by Rotaway International.